time for our Tuesday evening devotion around the Word of God. This is Brother Bagwell, and uh, I want to invite your attention back to Acts chapter 4. Earlier in the chapter, last night's devotion, uh, Peter and John were arrested for preaching about Jesus, healing a lame man. They were carried to court, the Sanhedrin that so hated Jesus, now is after these men of God. But they couldn't make the charge stick. They had to warn them and let them go. And that's where tonight's message begins. Chapter 4, verse 23. Many of you have your Bibles. And if you do not, if you trust me, I will read it, the text, to you. And being let go, Peter and John have been released from prison. Being let go, they went to their own company. They went to their own company. The, the uh, uh, noun there in Greek is idios. It means one's personal things, one's personal preferences. They went to their own company. You have to beg some people to go to church. Peter and John made a beeline. They went straight for the fellowship of believers. They went to their own company. Grandma Green taught me something years ago. Birds of a feather flock together. As soon as they were at liberty, they go to God's house to be around his children. Often when Paul traveled, first thing he will do, he'll find a gathering of believers and he'll meet with them. I mean, when he's on the way to a new field uh, to begin a new work for Almighty God, they went to their own company. When Judas died, the Bible says, uh, <clears throat> he went out, he hanged himself, <clears throat> he committed suicide. <clears throat> In other words, and he went to his own place, hell. He went to his own place, or somewhere of perdition. He went to his own place. Peter and John went to their own company. Where do you want to go? Do you enjoy church, or is it an obligation? Where is your heart's desire? And when they got to their own company, the church, they reported all that the chief priest and elders had said unto them, including, we warn you, don't preach again in the name of this Jesus. And we're tired of hearing about death, burial, and resurrection too. The Sanhedrin thought when they crucified the Lord, they were through with his name. Hallelujah. They're just beginning to hear his name. Now, there's some men here that are going to turn the world upside down. For the Lord Jesus Christ, they told them all they had said unto them. Verse 24, when the church, when their own company, when their fellow believers heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Let me tell you what that means. They, P-R-A-Y-E-D, they prayed. The early church prayed about everything. I'm making this evening's meditation. This is a rare uh, Tuesday night when I'm home. I'm sitting on the front porch in my rocker. This is a true evening meditation. And uh, as I sit here, my heart, not preaching in a revival this week, it canceled because of, uh, of uh, partly the virus situation. And the pastor said, and other reasons and he didn't uh, give me uh, all of the details about that uh, a rare but my heart is at church my heart is hearing that choir saying my heart is in picking up this bible right here and preaching thus saith the lord god they went to their own company and they told them what they had said and when the church heard that they lift up their voice they prayed they prayed they prayed 
The disciples later will say, we want to give ourselves continually to prayer, continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. Jesus, a great while before day, regularly, habitually, he would rise and go up to a mountainside somewhere and spend time with his father. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed. I heard someone say the church best marches forward on its knees, on her knees, praying, praying, praying. They're going to pray. When persecution comes, pray. When they take you to court, pray. When the devil's fighting, pray, pray, pray. They're going to call out to God. And it says they did it with one accord, with one passion, with one love, with one hunger, with one desire. They weren't too fast. They weren't half-hearted. And they said, Lord, thou art God. Boy, not a good way to start. Lord, thou art God. If you're going to pray, you better be talking to the right God. Lord, thou art God. The word Lord is curios. It gives the uh, Romans the word Caesar, curios, Caesar. That's the way they would say Caesar, curios, Caesar, Caesar. And it means the one who has supremacy, the one who is an authority. Lord, Lord, oh, I'm glad my Jesus has supremacy. Paul said that in all things he might have the preeminence. Lord, uh, thou art God. He's the true God. He's the living God. I need an amen. He's the only, only actual God. And Lord, you've made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all that in them. God, you're the creator. Brag on him a little bit. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Brag on him. You're the creator. You made the beautiful sunset a little while ago, and, and, and you'll create that wonderful sunrise in the morning on the other side of the house. And, and, and Lord, you're the, you're, you're the one who made these bodies miraculously. We're fearfully and wonderfully... Don't you let the devil rob you of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Don't you fall for the line that God did not create us, that we evolved from some lower form of life, heresy, untrue. In the beginning, God created there. Acknowledge Him as Creator. Oh, who by the mouth? God, by your mouth. Who by the mouth of thy servant David? How did David get into this? It's Peter and John. And this is the New Testament church. David, the author of the Psalms. David, a man after God's own heart. Uh, uh, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. I think they're going to quote a psalm. David is said, why do the heathen rage? By the way, here is proof David wrote Psalm 2. The theologians today, they're undecided. We don't know who wrote that beautiful psalm, too. And some of them don't even call it beautiful. I'll tell you who. David, you can't say that. That's not written in the... I got it right here. David wrote Psalm 2. How do you know? They're quoting it. Why do the heathen rage? Hey, y'all watch. I've got to tell you what these disciples in this church is doing. They arrested the men of God. They tried the men of God. Uh, they, they threatened the men of God. Don't you preach again in His name. Lord, that's the heathen. That's the lost people of the world. And they're raging. Lord, they're gritting their teeth. Lord, they're mad at you. Why do the people imagine a vain thing? Lord, they believe that their good works will get them to heaven instead of the grace of God and the blood of Jesus getting them to heaven. Lord, that's a thing. They let their minds dwell on vain things. The kings of the earth stood up. Chief priest, Herod, Pilate, the Caesar, the kings of the earth stood up. And the rulers, that's exactly who arrested them. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. That happened here in Acts 4. People ganging up on God's men. It's going to happen literally one of these days in the tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon. The, by the way, there's a pretty good semblance of it happening in America tonight. They are angry at God. They are rebelling at God. They hate the Ten Commandments. They hate uh, the blood-stained banner. They hate the precious book we hold dear to our hearts. Oh my, they're raging. They're gathered against the Lord. Looks like they're against Peter. 
It looks like they're against John. It looks like they're against the other ten disciples soon. It looks like they're against every Christian, but they're not. They're against the God those Christians love. They're against the Almighty Father in heaven who, who loves His church, Jesus, who gave Himself for it. Lord, they're against you. Listen to this. Lord, here's how much against you they are. They're against your holy child, Jesus. By the way, that's Jesus, God, whom you anointed, the word anointed. You made him the Messiah. You anointed him, both Herod, Pontius Pilate. Boy, he's calling names. They told me, you don't call names. <laughs> Luke didn't get the message. Uh, Herod, he's a rascal. Pontius Pilate, he's a reprobate. And the Gentiles and all the people of Israel were gathered together. Lord, they, they hated you. They have hated your men, but they hated uh, you first. And Lord, uh, that they, they, they're going to kill Jesus. They're going to put him on the cross. But Lord, all they're doing is whatever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. Lord, they played right into your hands. You sent Jesus to die. He is the Lamb of God foreordained before the foundation of the world. And Lord, uh, they're, they're clay in your hands. God, they're accountable. They're guilty. They'll go to hell if they don't get saved. But Lord, you, you are the, oh, thank you. God so loved the world he gave. He sent his only begotten son. Verse 29, and now Lord, behold their threatenings. Listen to them belching out their hatred against your men. And Lord, now the prayer's going to ask for something. We're finally getting, oh, they talked about the God of creation. They magnified his beautiful names. And then they talked about uh, the fact he quoted that psalm and worked out. Lord, what happened to me today when they threw me in jail? Thanks, Peter and John. It's exactly what Psalm 2 says. And God, it also says, He that sits in the heavens will laugh. It also says, God will take vengeance. It also says, God will judge them. Lord, ever better that, and we know it's going to happen. Lord, we count it an honor to serve you and to magnify your name. Lord, behold their threatenings. And Lord, here's what we ask. Lord, we don't ask that you destroy them. That's coming in time if they don't repent. Right now, we're not asking you judge them and, and, uh, and, and, and slay them. Lord, you will. Your time, your way. Uh, you're gonna, it's all heading toward the judgment of God. And the great, no, what we ask, Lord, is grant. Grant unto thy servants, would you give us that with all boldness, we can speak your word. That's the one thing they ask. God, give us boldness. To preach your word. No, I don't want this to sound ugly or wrong. I'm afraid we got a little. I'm afraid we've got a group of, uh, of preachers running around today who are sissies, who are scaredy cats, who are, who are, I don't know what word to use, who are absolutely afraid to stand up. They have lost their boldness. Oh, Dr. Bob Jones uh, Sr. used to pray, God, give me a backbone like a saw log. Help me to stand against the trend of modernism uh, that is taking over our land. Lord, give us boldness. That word boldness, parousia, parousia, or parousia. You can say it uh, different ways, but it means this, telling it all, saying everything. Lord, next time I stand before Annas, the high priest, next time I stand before Caiaphas, his son-in-law, next time I stand before the Senate, would you give me boldness? Would you give me Holy Ghost power? Would you let me tell the truth no matter what happens to me? Would you let me tell the truth to your honor and your glory? you got a preacher that tells the truth, you ought to say hallelujah. And if you've got a sissy uh, preacher, if you've got a preacher that's scared to declare the truth, you ought to get out of there and find a man of God who will tell the truth. Lord, would you give us boldness? Would you give us boldness that we may preach your word? God, we want to fulfill your word. I want to read verse 30. Lord, would you stretch forth your hand? Lord, would you let signs and wonders, miracles be done in the name of thy holy 
child Jesus. Lord Jesus, you promised us, Mark 16, the last two verses, that when you went to heaven, you're still going to be working with us. Your power would still be in our midst, that you would go with us confirming your words, that you would go with us and you'd allow us to work miracles for your honor and glory to get sinners saved. Lord, would you grant that, please? Would you, would you, would you do what you have promised? Lord, we're just laying hold to it. God, stretch forth your hand. Uh, I had a college professor, uh, and it's from Isaiah. Lord, make bare your mighty arm. Lord, roll up your sleeve, flex your muscle. Do something for us to the glory of God. <laughs> and when they had prayed, when they had asked God for boldness, when they had prayed through the eye of Scripture, when they had prayed and bragged on God as the Creator, when they had worshipped and honored His name, when they prayed, the place was shaken. The place was shaken. There where they're meeting with their own kind, their own Christ. It was shaken where they were assembled together. The church began to shake and it began to And they were all filled. It doesn't mean halfway or three quarters. As I said last night, they were filled to the brim, overflow. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake, God's already answered the prayer, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. They have been threatened. They could have easily been beaten, and they know it. And yet they leave saying hallelujah to God. Let's ask God for more boldness for round two because we're not going to quit preaching in His name. And as sure as the world, they're going to attack us again. God, give us boldness. Proverbs 28, 1, The righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee. The wicked flee when nothing is in pursuit. Talk about a prayer meeting. Talk about trusting God. Every prayer meeting doesn't have to be thank you, Lord, for the raise, though you should thank Him for it. Every prayer meeting don't have to be hallelujah. My blood pressure was normal, and and the, uh, and the blood report was good, and and the, and the, uh, the the major test that had me worried it came back fine, and uh, and uh, you sure ought to pray. Then they're praying when they've been put in jail. They're praying when things have gone wrong. They're praying that God would help them to stand true, not to sell out. Boy, Peter's not going to deny God this time. The Holy Ghost has empowered him. You can pray for things besides a new suit. You can pray for something besides another $100 bill. I wish some evangelists would learn that. I wish some pastors, I wish some Facebook members would, would learn that. Learn to pray God to give you courage. Learn to pray God to make you holy. Learn to pray God to build character. Learn to ask God to uh, give you love and joy and peace in your heart. That's the kind of praying Paul did. Verse 32. Occasionally, Luke stops and gives us a progress report. I mentioned that last night too. We're in a different text totally. But for example, at the end of chapter 2, and they continued in uh, doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, and, and in last night, earlier in chapter 3, and, and, and uh, uh, there were many that believed, and there were added about 5,000 some progress report. We've got one coming up now, and it is a whole paragraph. Look at verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed, the devil said nobody's going to get saved. The devil says we're in a losing cause. The multitude of them that believed, 3,000 got saved, and then perhaps 5,000 again, or that 5,000 may mean two more thousand to three plus a two. It's a, there is a multitude. There are, there are droves of people being born. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. One heart and one soul, one mind, one will, one emotion, one desire, and neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. They loved each other so much in that early church, they didn't say, that's my chariot, that's my ox, that's my villa. They didn't say, that's my little uh, biblos, my little library. They didn't call anything their own. 
Could I preach on that a minute? I believe in capitalism. I believe in the right to own property. That's what a lot of this rebellion's against. They're for socialism. They're for communism. I, I, I believe God is ordained that, uh, in fact, Scripture, Book of Proverbs, talking about taking care of what you own, including your beast and including your house and including your property. I understand that, but 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 watch. Neither said any of them all of the things they possessed were their own. But they had all things in common. Listen to this. It's not worded exactly this way in my King James. But listen to what's mine is yours. Anything I have and you need it, I can hear now. You don't have to knock on the door. Just go in the garage and get it. Just help yourself. Uh, if you, your ox is, is sickly and lost strength, come get my ox and plow with it. Uh, if, uh, if you've got company coming and you don't have room to house them, uh, the upper room is ready. Just go on up there and make yourself at home. I've always heard and I believe it. Faith begins in the heart. True faith in Jesus will affect your mind. It'll affect your brain. It'll affect your thinking. It'll affect your head. But eventually that faith, I need a good amen, will reach your wallet. It will reach your checkbook. It will reach your pocketbook. And you will want to give. Give. Uh, 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 Paul said, give like he's prospered you. Oh my, he's been good to me. He's been good to you. They're giving to one another in one mind and in one accord. Verse 33, because of that generous spirit, because of that attitude of graceful gift, with great power, with dynamite, it's dunamis, with great mega dynamite, mega tonnage, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them. Here's how I'm going to describe grace tonight. The smile of God was upon them. The goodness of God was upon them. The pleasure of God was all over them. The blessing he opened the windows of heaven and poured out blessings they couldn't handle because they didn't. Uh, they gave and they gave and they gave and they served and they served and then they suffered and suffered and prayed and prayed and praised and praised and worshipped and worshipped. The grace of God was all over them. Verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Nobody came behind. Nobody said, well, we didn't have any supper last. Nobody lacked. Nobody lacked. This is almost beyond description. It is almost, they loved each other so much and they loved the Lord Jesus. They knew Jesus was wealthy in heaven, walking the streets of gold. He came from the ivory palaces, but they knew full well. They knew full well he, the, he was rich, became poor for our sakes. Jesus became poor. Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Uh, they needed two coins. They needed two coins in order, in order to uh, pay the temple tax. Jesus didn't have it. Had to send Peter fishing to get that shekel in, in order to pay the temple tax. Oh my, oh, oh my. And, and, and as far as I know, everywhere Jesus went, he walked, he walked. He waves a poor man, except the time he rode the little donkey into Jerusalem. Oh my Savior, he but poor. He, he, but, but yet, yeah, and, and they took on that heart. Jesus gave his all. We'll give our all. We don't have to be wealthy. We don't, the love of money is the root of all evil anyway. And, uh, and uh, nobody lacked. Nobody lacked. And as many as were possessors of lands or houses, they sold them. I don't know that everybody sold everything up front and they pulled a, a ton of money, but I think as the need developed, oh, he's sick. He's not all, no longer able to work as a potter. He's going to lose his home. I got some property. I'll sell it. I'll sell it and bring the money and I'll lay it at the disciples' feet and they can appropriate to those who have need. That's exactly what's going on here. And they, they sold lands and houses and they brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. Oh my, a revival has broken out. Oh my, I heard an evangelist. He's in heaven now. 
And he was a young evangelist when he went on to glory. He said this. You can gauge a real revival. You can gauge the depth of revival by the quality of the love offering. Now, being an evangelist, I might not should have said that. I'm not after money. You've not heard me one time in these evening meditations mention a need. If I had ten needs, you would not hear about it. I would not broadcast it to you. That is our policy. We do not go around talking about needs. We have somebody wants to know a need of mine. They about got to twist my arm to get it out of me. I will not tell it voluntarily. But once they found out the need, once they heard of the need, oh, they were willing to give. They were willing to share. Uh, that, and they'd lay it at the apostles' feet. Uh, and distribution was made to every man as he had. There's a widow over there hungry. Take her this food. Uh, there, uh, there's a man over there and he's gone lame. We don't know what. Maybe he's got uh, the palsy. Oh, would you take this to him? He's about to lose his house. Take a thousand dollars, whatever it may be, and pay off that mortgage. Pay off that. They loved that deeply. They loved that dearly. It reached their pocketbooks. Generous. Given, it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed that bubbling over you. You'll never, oh, I had an old preacher friend. He said, you'll never outgive God. If you're stingy, if you're tight with your money, that's not a good sign. The Holy Ghost is the author of liberality in our giving. Boy, this thing... Luke's giving the progress report on the church. <laughs> Gave to every man as he had need. I don't think there were any freeloaders free there. I don't think there were any lazy people there either. They just helped each other when time, times got rough. Verse 36. I got two more verses. And Josie's. Who in the world is Josie? Some man in the early church. Joseph is probably a shortened form of Joseph, which means in the Hebrew, adding and adding. Give me some more, give me some more, give me some more. Would you add to that? And I'm not talking about money now. Give me more grace, Lord. Give me more power. Give me more strength. Give me more courage. Give me more wisdom. Give me more understanding, if you will. Joseph, who by the apostles was nicknamed, it says surnamed, it means called Barnabas. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Barnabas. These last two verses want to talk about Barnabas. I, 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 I don't know why, preacher, but which is being interpreted the son of consolation. His name, it's paraclesis, consolation. Uh, it, uh, that, 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 that word consolation, it is the same noun Jesus used of the Holy Ghost as the comforter. The comforter. Paraclesis comes from the verb parakaleo. Barnabas is a consoler. He is a son. He's got it all over him. He's saturated with consolation. And what does paraclesis mean? He'll go right by your side when you're in need. He'll put that arm around you. He'll love you. He'll encourage you. He'll help you. He'll give to you. He'll pray for you. Isn't that what the Holy Ghost does for us? He is our paracletos. He is our encourager. He is our strengthener. He is a, the son of consolation. He's a Levite. He's from the loins of Levi. He's out of Cyprus. He's, he's, he comes from that country out there in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the Mediterranean. He had some land, and he sold his land. He had property, and he sold his property. Why did he sell his property? On hard times? No. Why did he sell his property? Good investment, better found elsewhere? No. Because he heard the church had a need. He heard there might have been a brother lacking. He sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. An example of that gracious kind of giving. I had a church during this downtime, this time that uh, meetings had canceled due to the, uh, to the virus, uh, what do they call it, pandemic. They said, we got to cancel, Brother Bagwell. We're not going to be able to have them, but we're going to send you a love offering anyway. 
Well, there'll be a check in the mail. I know you can't come, but your heart was to come. And we've got a little. We can do that and help you. That's exactly. Uh, uh, somebody gave. Somebody sacrificed. And they laid it at the apostles' feet. And they laid it at the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost said, send Brother Bagwell some. And I got a feeling they sent another evangelist and another some. And I got a feeling they didn't let their missionaries down. Giving. Out of the spirit of love. It is a trait of revival. It is a trait of... I find the greatest meetings I'm in, they always take care of the preacher. I find the meetings where it's like pulling teeth to get liberty. You can't hardly get a word across. They won't amen. They won't smile. And they won't help you. I find that's where you're going to leave with the least love of revival, Holy Ghost power. There will be a generous heart to go with it. Now I want to close. By saying something about Barnabas. Time and time again in the New Testament. I want to be a Barnabas. I want to be an exhorter. Paraclesis. I want to be an encourager. I want to be an edifier. Get me some amen. I want to be an uplifter. I don't want to tear down. I want to build up. Every time you see Barnabas in the New Testament. With a, uh, uh, let me just say, the majority of times you see Barnabas in the New Testament, best worded. He's helping somebody. He's encouraging somebody. He's uplifting somebody. Here in Acts 4, he sold land and he brought it. And he said, would you help that brother? Would you help that sister who's lacking? Some of them don't have good clothes. Take this money and buy some clothes or or, 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 or get Dorcas to sort some clothes and, and get them over there. Dorcas, of course, uh, lives otherwise. And, and uh, But she made clothes for the ladies in her church, the widowed ladies. And then later, when the church at Antioch, a Gentile church, caught on fire for God, people are getting saved right and left, and they don't have anybody to teach them. They <laughs> Barnabas says, I know just the man. By then, Saul of Tarsus had been saved. Paul, and uh, he's down yonder around his hometown somewhere, and he's preaching. And Barnabas goes down there, makes that trip, finds Saul. Paul brings him back and said, he's a man who can teach you and disciple you. Barnabas sold land and gave money. Barnabas did the church one of the greatest favors there. Found Saul and brought Paul. And Paul became the great teacher, the great edifier of the church. He is always encouraging others. Even when there's that little uh, rift between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. <laughs> Barnabas, he took John Mark. He put his arm around little John Mark. And they sailed out to do some preaching elsewhere. Always helping. Always encouraging. That's the way Brother Bagwell wants to be remembered. How about you? I got a I got a close. I'm out of time. Chapter five tomorrow night. It's a it's another it's another chapter altogether. Not as bright and encouraging as this one, I'm afraid. Don't be a slanderer. Don't be a gossip. Don't tear things down. Be a paraclesis. Be an encourager. Be an exhorter. Be an upbuilder. Be an edifier. If somebody's taken in a fault, lift them up. Help them out. Barnabas, an encourager with a generous giving heart. Lord, I just have to pray. Make our churches on fire. Send us Holy Ghost revival. May we concentrate on the preaching and on fellowship and breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, and eating together in love. And may we concentrate on praying. Even when hard times come, may we pray. God, give us this spirit of giving. Give us this spirit of love. Give us this spirit of, oh God, give us boldness to serve you. God, send revival. We beg and pray to us individually and to our churches. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. What part of the rocking chair sermon? Preaching from the front porch. Uh, I hear crickets all around me. They're having an enjoyable evening. I've had a pretty good time in the Word of God uh, the last 33 minutes myself. Stay faithful. Stay true. Somebody tell me what hit you. What stood out in this meditation? What will you take home with you? What will, what will you remember as the days come and go? I'd love to hear your response. Still, tomorrow night, when we open up the Bible again and study, I invite you to be with us for another evening meditation.